Here we go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fall fiesta of the Weiner Wellness Week. This is our fourth wellness week of the year, and we're back to virtual again. Um, we're hoping to do some sort of hybrid with this eventually, but um, this is really great because I don't know if you saw the last presentation, and Dr. Orbach, good luck uh, following up on this, but I know you'll be nothing short of amazing. Um, we had Judy Mikovitz speaking. She has reached hundreds of people already, and I know this video is going to be shared a lot. So I just want to thank everyone for tuning in, joining, and um, giving a like on the Weiner Wellness Facebook page. If you're watching this on a friend's page, make sure you click onto our page here, like it, so you can follow up on um, this whole list, this whole schedule. We have a week long of events here, but um, Dr. Orbach, you've been at the Weiner Wellness Center. Um, you've been doing these presentations for us, Wellness Week after Wellness Week, and today you're talking about chiropractic rehab and neurology, so I'll let you go ahead with that. And if anyone has any questions, you can leave comments on the box below, and I can ask Dr. Orbach anything. Am I set? Yeah, we're ready All for right. you. Okay. Well, first of all, hi, everybody. My name is Gideon Orbach. I've been practicing neuromusculoskeletal chiropractic. Um, in November, I'll be celebrating my 19-year anniversary of getting into practice. And two weeks ago, I celebrated my 13-year anniversary at the Weiner Wellness Center. So I've been at it a while, uh, hardly a lifetime, but certainly long enough to make a few observations and see a few things that work and a few things that don't work. And hopefully we'll get into that uh, over the course of the presentation. Um, I want to, you're right, Candace, Judy Mikovits is a tough act to follow. So Judy, if you're listening, I just want to welcome you to joining our team and being part of our, our show here. So anyhow, this is Weiner Wellness Week. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit earlier this morning. This is a, a state-of-the-art nutrition store. We carry some of the best brands and some of the best products that you'll find anywhere in the country, probably anywhere in the world, but we're also a chiropractic and muscle therapy and nutritional consultation clinic. And my role here is that I practice, as I said, neuromusculoskeletal chiropractic. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get that into some real detail and I can give everybody a better understanding of what I'm about, what I can do for them, how I can benefit them and make it all happen. Um, in a pre-COVID world, this presentation was done live. We had uh, um, an audience and I always had somebody, it seems, who was trying to draw me off track or torment me while I was lecturing. And, you know, I've been working on my personality a lot lately, so I kind of enjoy that. Um, it's different on Zoom, of course, but we adapt. You're probably looking at your screen wondering why this chiropractor looks so crooked. Well, that human zigzag that's me. I have my computer propped up on a stack of books on one side and a stack of notes on the other side. And, and it's all about just adapting. So I want to encourage everybody to participate as much as possible. We're going to go through a few exercises together. If you have questions, comments, or even moral outrages, feel free to type them into your Facebook feed. Uh, Candace will make me aware of what's going on behind the scenes and we'll roll with it. We'll just keep adapting. So far, so good? All right, yep. so speaking of adapting, let's define the word health, first of all. I know that we all aspire and endeavor to be healthier people and to uh, figure out other ways that we may not necessarily have thought of to take care of ourselves. Uh, um, but what does it mean to be healthy? How, how, can we, how can we define this? How can we put this abstract quality of life into the spoken language? So my definition of health is this. Being healthy means that you have the ability to recognize, interact with, adapt to, and overcome your environment, both internally and externally. So recognizing our environments, interacting with it, adapting to it, and even overcoming. Our external environment, hmm, that's what's going on in our world. That means are we able to navigate ourselves from point A to point B without tripping and falling over somebody's feet? Are we able to drive down the highway without experiencing road rage? Um, are we able to make our way through the grocery store, picking out the right uh, ripe fruits and vegetables to our satisfaction? How are we interacting with one another? How are we influencing one another? That's the external environment. Our internal environment is a little more complicated. That's the nutrition, 
the chemistry, the things that we're putting into our bodies, the way our, um, our nervous system, our brain is able to uh, regulate our organ systems, to be able to influence our digestion and our metabolism, to be able to get our bodies to move the way that we're supposed to or the way that we desire to move. That's our internal environment. So being able to have control of your environment, to me, that's my definition of health. So in a very egocentric way, I'll tell you that even though my computer is propped up on a stack of books on one side and a stack of notes on the other side, and I look like an asymmetrical chiropractor, I think it's a sign of good health to be able to adapt to what's going on. So far so good. Big definition number two, another word that we throw around a lot and we talk about, especially in a chiropractic clinic and a state-of-the-art nutrition store uh, in a wellness center like this is the word pain. Pain is an individual, emotional, subjective response to harmful stimulus. So pain is essentially an emotion. That's why some people have incredible pain tolerances and some people are irritated and hurt by what are seem like relatively small things. There's no right or wrong answer. There's no absolute. Pain is a warning. It's an indication that, hey, I really have to do something about this problem. The hazard lights are going on. That's pain. Some people's hazard lights go on uh, uh, at the drop of the dime. Some go on at a drop of a ton of bricks. And in no way, shape or form do I wanna belittle anybody's experience Harmful stimulus can be emotional, uh, it can be environmental, it can be uh, a nutritional, caused by a nutritional deficiency, uh, it can be caused by anything that you put into your body, anything that you have contact with. There are a lot of reasons why uh, people would be experiencing pain, including the, uh, the environmental stressors that we're all underneath uh, in these tricky times to negotiate our way through. But my world is physical. My patients come to me because they have physical aches and pains, because their bodies hurt. And, and that's what I talk about. And I throw out this disclaimer at the expense of people who have different, different issues that I don't want to undermine or belittle. So with that being said, um, let's, uh, let's start with a little exercise that I promised we would include. Um, let's work on a little bit of deep breathing together. First of all, I want everybody to sit up as straight and tall as they most possibly can. And what I want you guys to do is to inhale through your noses. And as you feel yourself inhaling, I want you to let your chest and your abdomens expand. So we're growing out this way, making ourselves big around instead of inhaling and elevating our shoulders and shrugging up and becoming big on this plane. So big deep breath in through your nose. Everything expands and we're gonna hold this for a few seconds and blow out through your mouths. One more time, big deep breath in through your nose. Everything's becoming big around, our lungs are expanding, our rib cages are opening up and we're gonna blow out through our mouths. So this is low-tech rehab exercise number one. When I talk about low-tech exercises, that means we're just learning how to move our bodies. We're learning how to uh, position ourselves. Uh, uh, we're not gonna use expensive, fancy equipment. You can if you want. I'm not gonna discourage anybody from building a home gym or going to the gym. But when I talk about rehab exercises with my patients, I wanna keep it as simple as possible principle. We wanna use what we have uh, and not go off in search of expensive stuff. And we wanna make it as user-friendly, as accessible as possible. So over the course of this uh, um, lecture workshop conversation together, we're gonna to take a few more breaks to take two or three deep breaths. And uh, as we get more and more into it, I'm gonna explain the why, always the why. So we talked about pain as being an emotion, correct? Have you ever been told or heard somebody describe their pain and they went to go see their doctor or their therapist or their chiropractor or whomever it was that was gonna help them through it and report, they told me it was all in my head. I think we've all heard that either directly to ourselves or about somebody. And you know what? It's absolutely true. 
Because pain is emotion, pain is stored in your brain. So what we really have to do, the $100 million question is, what are we going to do with the body where we perceive pain or discomfort or anguish or, or harmful feelings in our hand or our wrist? How do we intercept those messages between the brain and the body? And how do we, how do we diminish the pain by moving the body, by doing low tech physical things to influence a change in the neurochemistry and a change in the neurological experience? That's what, uh, um, that's what neuromusculoskeletal chiropractic is all about. So let's, uh, um, let's, let's talk about that. Um, now I have, a, um, I have a pretty good track record over my 19 years of practice of um, being able to help people with these types of problems and these types of, of physical pain. Um, I don't have all the answers, nobody does. And I want you to beware of anybody who claims to have all the answers, but I got a really nice uh, piece of the pie. So here's what we're gonna do. Let's uh, imagine that I take a string of dental floss and I tie a knot in it. And I put that knot right here in the between the bottom two front teeth. And somebody out there, maybe Candace because she's sitting across from me, grabs the string of dental floss and gives me a hard sustained pull. So she's pulling the bottom part of my mouth, my lower jaw forward, using the dental floss as a handle. Can you guys all picture that so far so good, Candace? Good. I'm gonna have a friction rub and my gum is gonna bleed and it's gonna hurt. But my real problems are gonna be here at the hinge of my jaw because as you pull, my mouth is gonna to start to slide forward. And these very small muscles here, they're actually not that small, they're pretty dense. They're the muscles that help me chew to open and close and clench my jaw and, and tear through my food. So they're very strong when they're moving on the plane of motion that they're designed to do. But when they have to play tug of war against Candace pulling with her dental floss, eh, now we got a problem. So what's gonna happen is these muscles of my jaw are going to tighten and they're gonna spasm and they're gonna start pulling in a direction that's disadvantageous for me. And they're gonna clamp down and they're gonna limit the blood supply in that particular area of my body. And there's gonna be inflammation built up and I'm gonna have a difficult time chewing. Hopefully uh, everybody can see that in their mind's eye. Uh, any comments, questions, moral outrages? Good, so I'm gonna keep going. So if we're gonna repair this whole scenario, there are three things that have to happen. One, we gotta get rid of the inflammation. That's a chemical process. Nutritional Frontiers puts out some great anti-inflammatories. We're a, full, a fully stocked nutrition store with some of the best ingredients you're gonna find anywhere. We have more anti-inflammatory nutrients than, than the day is long to list off, but we solve chemical problems with chemistry. The second thing that has to happen is we have to repair the mechanics of the hinge of the jaw. Somehow, some way we have to stretch these small stabilizing muscles. We got to open and close the jaw and retract it and bring it forward and retract it again. And we got to, we got to uh, undo the, the damage, the tissue damage that was caused by the pulling on the dental floss and the change of movement pattern that my jaw was forced to undergo. The third thing that has to happen in order to fix all of this is Candace is going to have to quit pulling on the dental floss. Otherwise, we're doing the same thing over and over again. Now, what does that mean in the human body? Muscles connect to tendons, tendons connect to bone. So a muscle or a group of muscles will tighten and they're going to spasm and they're going to pull in a direction that's disadvantageous for us. If we take the example of a forearm, this group of muscle in here will tighten and it's going to pull towards the elbow, possibly in response to some sort of either blunt trauma or repetitive micro trauma. As I'm typing, I'm overusing that group of muscle. As I'm steering my car and gripping the steering wheel, I'm tightening my hands 
and I'm trying to adapt to my environment and everybody's driving crazy. So I have that what everybody except me is driving crazy. So I have that white knuckle grip on my hands as I choke the life out of my steering wheel. It's really the same motion, just different extremes, the typing, clenching of the fists here, cutting my food, writing. So many different activities that we can think of involve curling our hands into a fist and this group of muscle over the course of time, it's gonna tighten it's gonna spasm and it's gonna to pull towards my elbow. In the forearm, you can see very well that these bands, these thick bands, these tendons, if you follow the tendon, you come to a point where the muscle and the tendon blend into one, they're continuous with one another. And then if we follow the tendon the other way, it attaches to the bone of the wrist or maybe we get a little deeper and find the tendons that actually curl fingers into a fist. So the muscle is pulling, the tendon is like the dental floss, and it's pulling, 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 creating more inflammation, more uh, aggravating torque, more tension, and it's operating upon the bones or the joints of the hand and the fingers and the wrist, much like the hinge of the jaw is being uh, uh, acted upon as we pull the dental floss. So far so good, Candace. Okay, we're gonna come right back to this in a moment. Let's take a quick break and do a couple more deep breaths. Everybody, please sit up as tall as possible. And we're going to inhale through our noses and our chest and our abdomens are getting big as they're filling up like balloons. And we're gonna blow out through our mouths. Let's do that again. Big deep breath in through your nose. Everything is expanding. And we're gonna blow out through our mouths again. One last deep breath in through your nose. Chest and abdomen are expanding to their full capacity. We're gonna hold and let's blow out through our mouths. Okay, Candace, so far so good? Anyway, so we're talking about how are we gonna fix this problem in the forearm, the, the tendons of the wrist and the movement of the hand where the actual pain is, uh, is localized. So what we're gonna do is this, we're gonna release the tension on the tight muscles. That means we're gonna do some therapy, whether it's muscle therapy with Adam, whether it's active range of motion or active muscle release with me, whether it's assisted stretching, we're going to get the tension to come out of the, the muscle. In turn, the muscle stops pulling excessive torque on the, uh, on the tendons. And then we got to get the hand and the wrist to move the way they're supposed to. So we're going to do the chiropractic adjustments to the hand, to the wrist, to the fingers, to all the joints that are indicated in that region of the body. Now, why is this so important? In between joints, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the hinge of the jaw, it doesn't man matter if we're talking about the carpal bones and their formation in the wrist, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the joints of the bones of the spine, joints have very similar properties. Where two bones come together and they move, we have a joint. And in those joint spaces, we have very specialized nervous tissue called mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors are generally speaking pressure sensitive. So if you compress joints or you restrict their ranges of motion and we increase the pressure in the joint, the mechanoreceptors can't do what they're supposed to do. They're sensitive to the pressure. What is it that we want the mechanoreceptors to do? The mechanoreceptors send messages into the nervous system, through the nerves of the periphery, to the spinal cord, up the spinal cord, towards the brain, where they're gonna alert the brain to where we are in space. When the brain has good communication with the body, orienting ourselves as to our location in space, toward uh, um, how we're moving, the brain is gonna fire at a much higher frequency. Uh, the brain is going to have a lot more output 
to, uh, um, to govern the body, to control our organ systems, to control our, uh, our ranges of motion, uh, to control every single cell of the body, which is in constant contact with the brain itself. When we have tissue destruction, when we have tight muscles, when we have inflammation built up, when we have uh, um, joints that aren't moving the same the way they're supposed to, instead of having those mechanoreceptors firing, we have a different neuro brain body communication awareness occurring. And what happens is with tissue destruction, when bodies are, are tight and spasmed and inflamed and not moving the way they're supposed to, we start to release something called substance P. The substance P will send the opposite messages of the mechanoreceptors to the brain. We start to experience and perceive pain. We have discomfort. We stop producing our natural endorphins and our natural enkephalons. And, and instead, we start to produce chemicals that uh, uh, register as painful, chemicals that uh, skew the communication between our brains and our bodies. We start to lose perception of where we are in space. And if you've ever had pain or discomfort, and I'm sure everybody listening has at one point or another, you probably notice how awkwardly you move and how tentatively you move. Those are the things that we want to be able to eliminate and to correct. So neuromusculoskeletal chiropractic is simply the practice of this. Instead of looking at bones that are out of place or bones that are misaligned, we're looking at the movement pattern of the joints. Is my elbow able to bend and extend through its full range of motion? Am I able to turn my head from side to side and look at uh, what's going on in my periphery? If I were to squat down, do my knees bend like true hinges or do they wobble a little bit like they are uh, um, rotating instead of hinging? Um, am I able to make a circle with the bone of my thigh in the hip socket? We're looking at ranges of motion. We're not taking x-rays of people to determine something is out of place or something is misaligned. Now, don't get me wrong. If somebody's in a traumatic accident, if there's a reason to suspect a red flag or, or a fracture or a break, by all means, we want to get internal imaging and we want to get pictures of, of what's going on with those bones before we start doing hands-on forceful treatment. If there's been no traumatic injury, if there's no reason to suspect a fracture or deep, deep bone bruises that could turn into fractures very easily, or even if there was a tumor of the bone, if we're not suspecting any of those things, we don't need to take a picture of it. We need to assess how it moves and we got to figure out why it's not moving the way it's supposed to. And then we got to take action to get the, uh, um, the joints to move through their full ranges of motion. Now, so instead of looking at making an adjustment and moving the joint or moving the, the bone that's out of place from point A to point B, let's just worry about moving it through its comprehensive and complete range of motion and getting mechanoreceptors to fire, as opposed to the tissue destroyed substance P to fire. So I like to look at the body as this, muscles and bones and tendons and ligaments, they're all little switches that I like to flip and maneuver and coax and stretch and maybe even force and certainly adjust to get them to move the way they're supposed to in order to trigger those areas of the body to start to release more mechanoreceptor messages and less substance P messages so we can send messages up the spinal cord to the brain that says, here we are in space, it's time to feel good. It's time to get out of pain. So far, so good, Candace. Questions, comments, moral outrages? Oh, no. <laughs> I hope people are paying attention. Either that, I'm doing a good job of explaining what, uh, um, what I'm doing. So we're looking to, to change these messages. We're looking to intercept the substance P messages going to the, uh, um, to the brain and change them into mechanoreceptor, uh, um, mechanoreceptor messages. What else are we doing with these adjustments and these manipulations and flipping the switches that are muscles and joints? We're certainly looking to, uh, um, 
to get the rib cage to loosen up, to make people able to, or to help people be able to breathe deeply from their diaphragms and feel their rib cages expanding and to feel their spine opening up and their chest cavities opening up as they breathe, rather than using this group of muscle here uh, um, as a pulley system to lift the rib cage up as we're breathing. Um, why is that important? Well, every single metabolic process that goes on in the human body is oxygen dependent in, in some way, shape or form. If we're gonna have a protest and one group of us is gonna go on a hunger strike and another group of us is gonna go on a thirst strike and the third group of us is just gonna hold our breaths until we get what we want, who's gonna last the longest and who's gonna be out quickly? What we really want to do is make sure that we're breathing deeply and comprehensively. And if our rib cages and our thoracic spines are, are stuck, if they've lost ranges of motion, if they're unable to expand and open, allowing us to breathe, well, of course, we're going to use these accessories, we're going to call it accessory muscles of respiration, hiding uh, below my mask, uh, in the front of the neck, at the top of the chest. These guys will act as a pulley and we're gonna lift our collarbone and the top of our rib cage up. Once again, we talked about this in the context of what are these muscles here at the side of the face at the hinge of the jaw designed to, to do? They're not designed to play tug of war with Candace when she pulls on my bottom teeth with her dental floss, that's for sure. Capable of doing it, but it doesn't mean that they should. These muscles here, capable of lifting the rib cage up, but they really shouldn't. So as I said, this is a chiropractic clinic. In addition to being a state-of-the-art nutrition store, we see, my, when I say we, myself, uh, Dr. Honigman, uh, Adam, Adam Karwa, our muscle therapist, um, we see a lot of people who have headaches. And, and there are a number of different reasons why somebody might have a headache. I mean, we can't, we can't pigeonhole everybody into one category. I said at the very beginning, don't trust people who claim to have the answer when there are a number of possible answers. But when we're assessing people for what's causing this headache, one of the things that we always have to look at is how are they breathing? Is it all coming from here? If so, let's correct that problem. So when we do our deep breathing exercises, this is a universal exercise that is appropriate for uh, uh, really for everybody. Everybody should be doing their deep breathing exercises every day, regardless of their condition. One of the reasons why you might find yourself working at a desk or working behind a steering wheel or working in a position where you're hunched over down in here and you're using these accessory muscles of respiration and they tighten and you're unable to breathe deeply from your diaphragm and it causes headaches. What else does the deep breathing do? Well, we have to look at, uh, um, at our cerebellum. The cerebellum is part of the brain. It's in the back of the brain and it's responsible or it's primarily responsibility is to help modulate coordinated movement. Candace, any questions, comments, or moral outrages at this point? Yes, actually, we do have a question okay. uh, relative to chiropractic. And um, it's what can you do if, knee, if a knee replacement is needed due to bone on bone pain? And that's something I hear a lot of. So that's a really good question. That's an excellent question. All right. See, this is what this is what I like so much about having the live presentations is that I'm going to talk about a concept and, and somebody up front is, or in the back or the middle or wherever, maybe across the room is gonna ask a question that's 100% relative to the topic, but is a little off topic from the, the, the thread that I'm on. And, and I'm, whoever asked that question, I'm grateful. You're making me feel like I'm in a, a crowded room again. Um, well, bone on bone arthritis is, is that's, that's very difficult to treat. Uh, because uh, um, there has to be physical space between the bones so that they can move freely. So instead of saying, what are we going to do to repair the bone on bone? The first question we're going to do is we'll say, what can we do to lubricate the joints and to make sure that uh, even if the space is, is greatly massively diminished, we can still move the knee through its proper planes. And, and I would start with the, the HDA plus, the hyaluronic acid, which is really 
when I first started with the Weiner Wellness Center, the HA Plus, man, 13 years ago, I think that was you guys' first product. It came out in a gold labeled bottle. Uh, I thought, I mean, I thought Jamie and Dr. Weiner, like you haven't seen happiness like you saw on Jamie and Dr. Weiner's face when they put out the first product. So the HA Plus, now that has stood the test of time. It's been, it was effective then, it's effective now. From a hands-on neuromusculoskeletal chiropractic point of view, let's look at your knee. First of all, let's consider the musculature of your quadricep. The, those are the four components of the big muscle of the front of your thigh. Your hamstring muscle group, that's the back of the thigh. Let's look at the muscles along the side of your leg, your iliotibial bands, your tensor fascia lata muscle, even the glute, the glute medius, the glute minimus, the piriformis muscle. I'm just naming anatomical parts, uh, mainly around your hip at this point. And let's see if those muscles are pulling asymmetrically. And let's study the attachments between the bones of the femur, that's the big bone of your thigh, and the bone of your tibia, that's the, um, the shin bone. And, and let's figure out if muscles are pulling on each other so hard with such an asymmetrical force that it's literally compressing those bones into each other and figure out, do you really have bone on bone arthritis or do you have the, the X-ray illusion of bone on bone arthritis because those bones are being so pulled together by such a great force on one side and such a, a dampened down or diminished force on the other side. So to whoever asked that question, man, I'd love to have a look at you and figure this out and see what we can do. And if you're in the Pittsburgh area, we see, we see patients from all over the area. And if you're, you know, this is the beauty of Zoom and Facebook. I know that people are tuning in from anywhere they have an internet connection. If you're not in the Pittsburgh area and, and you want to pursue this with us, why don't you make sure to send me a message or indicate so. And when I look over the, um, the comments and the questions later this afternoon or this evening, uh, let me know what area you're in. And maybe I know somebody or can help you find somebody appropriate uh, who looks at things in a similar manner in your neck of the woods. So far, so good, Candice. Any more or can I? Yeah, that was great. And I think okay. you really hit it with a good point, starting off with looking at where you are, whether it's bone on bone or whatever the x-ray showed and mm. looking at lubricating what's there, yes. building that back up. And HA plus is a great product to start with because mm -hmm. that helps with the formation of all of that, building yeah. back up the synovial fluid in between the joints, building back up the cartilage. And you started with the muscles of the quadriceps, the hamstrings, everything around it, because it's not just the actual knee and the bone on bone situation. Right. It's all of that that's being affected and playing a role in that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times whenever, you know, I talk to people who are asking me, well, do you have anything that does, you know, that works for bone on bone? My doctor said I have this and I need a knee mm -hmm. replacement. That's all that they tell you is they need a knee replacement. And it's like, is that really the only option? You know, did, did they not discuss some of the things that you brought up? Like mm -hmm. in the matter of just the last couple minutes, you addressed one of the biggest issues that people deal with in terms of pain. You know, I hear so many people with that bone on bone and it's just, this is the way we want to address it and fix that because mm -hmm. you even hear that after a knee replacement, they don't feel better or they feel better for a little bit or the recovery's long and right. it's expensive. You know, some people might take the HA plus up to three months before they start to feel something, but so right. you've had this for years, you might feel it within a couple of days. I've heard that before with the mm -hmm. HA plus, you know, they might be taking X flame along with it, fish oil to really build that back up and support that. But a knee replacement isn't your only option. So it was a great answer. Yeah, and, and your, you know, your, your follow-up about the synovial fluid was right there on the nose. Good job. Um, now, when a, patient, when a patient comes in and tells me they have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, my first thought is not muscles, tendons, uh, replacement surgery. Uh, a few minutes ago, we touched on the concept of pressure-sensitive mechanoreceptors. So, I, I've been one of the one of the dis, one of the disadvantages of doing something for a long time is is you start asking the questions that work for you and what you've seen. Look, I've seen success with this in the past by traveling down a certain pathway, and and you almost have it. You have to remind yourself: present time consciousness. Listen to this patient. Stop going off on a tangent in your own mind. But so when I think about somebody telling me they have bone on bone arthritis, 
the question, the first question I'm asking myself is what's happening to those pressure sensitive mechanoreceptors? Are they being crushed? Uh, are they unable to fire? How much substance P is being elicited from that particular region of the body? And what effect does it have on the brain? And if we think about the neurological concept of the brain, and we talk about the, the way the brain modulates pain, you might perceive it in that knee that's supposedly degenerated to the point where it should be replaced. But the pain, once again, what we have to do is change transmission of of neurochemistry into the brain to influence the brain's ability to suppress the pain. So I wonder how many people are walking around out there with what they feel like is mild knee discomfort. My knee is a little stiff today. And they went to go see their orthopedist for an x-ray out of curiosity and found out that their knee was just as degenerated as this person who claims to have, I mean, claims to have, I mean, I believe you, um, just this person who says that they have bone on bone arthritis and they have to have a knee replacement. And then we have somebody else who has the exact same physical presentation. Uh, um, and they have mild knee tightness. I went for my annual physical. My doctor said I should get an x-ray. So I got an x-ray and they learned that their physical presentation put them in horrible shape, but they really didn't feel that way. Well, I would speculate that those people have great, great mechanoreceptor firing from other parts of their body that override what's going on in the knee that's being degenerated. So you might be this person who has horribly compressed knee pain, horribly compressed knees, it's causing you pain, but you have other problems throughout your body that may be at a subclinical threshold that really, they're not bad enough for you to feel it, but they're bad enough to contribute to what's going on with the pain of your knee. So we might start uh, as part of a, a treatment plan is let's look at what's going on in your feet. There are 28 bones in each foot. 26 of them are movable. So that means there are a lot of adjustments that can be made in the foot. That's a lot of mechanoreceptors that can fire off that might start changing the way the brain and the body are talking to each other without even making an adjustment to the knee in the, in the first place. So from, from my perspective, there's a, there is a lot that we can look at and there is a lot that we can try. So once again, if you're that person with been diagnosed with bone on bone arthritis, man, I'd love to have a look at you. Okay. So I want to get back to, I mean, if we've, if we, unless the, that person has a follow-up question on Facebook, I really want to get back to uh, the cerebellum for a second. So we're talking about the cerebellum and how it's a part of the brain that the, the main task of the cerebellum is coordinated movement. So now would be a great time to do another rehab exercise. And I'm going to, I'm going to illustrate with my hands, but I'm talking about feet because you know, the name of the game here in this world we're living in is, is adapting. And I'm not going to put my computer on the floor and hope you can see me. So imagine these are my feet. We're sitting at our chair. My right heel is into the ground and my left side, I'm standing on my tiptoes. So what I'm going to do is switch back and forth. I'm holding my position long enough to establish it, establish it and not relying on momentum. And I'm going to switch and switch. So what are we doing here? Love multitasking. First of all, first of all, we're moving in a coordinated fashion. That means we're engaging our cerebellum. Second of all, as we just talked about a split second ago, there are 28 bones in the foot, 26 of them are movable. So we got our feet, this is very important. I neglected to tell you all and I apologize. I want your feet facing 12 o'clock. I'm not gonna let one foot deviate out to, to, uh, to two or one, we're at 12. Not moving to 10 or 11, 12 o'clock facing forward the whole time. When we're in this position and we're, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not used to talking this much. Um, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> when we're in this position and we're moving from our tiptoe to our heel and rolling forward and backward this way, we're moving those bones through their um, through their ranges of motion that they're this, this. We're moving our feet through their ranges of motion that um, they're ordained to go through. And what are we doing with those pressure sensitive mechanoreceptors? We're getting them to fire off the way they should. Another word about the cerebellum. 
the cerebellum inhibits the sympathetic nervous system. When we talk about things that you can do, let's divide human activity into voluntary and non-voluntary stuff. If I ask you to wave your arm, your hand and say goodbye, you understand the language. If you want, you can do it. If you don't want, you don't have to, it's okay. You made a decision. Do I want to? Sure, bye. No, I'm gonna stick around for a little while. What if I ask you to dilate your pupils? You gotta have some sort of um, external stimulus to create uh, um, the ability to dilate and constrict your pupils. It's not voluntary stuff. No matter how badly you want to, you're not able to without maybe manipulating the light in the room. So this non-voluntary stuff that we talk about, we're gonna say that's part of the autonomic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system can be subdivided into two categories, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is sort of our wine and dine, rest and digest, everything is calm, status quo, I think I'm gonna take a nap. Sounds good. Our sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, is our fight or flight, uh, I'm in survival mode. Uh, um, nervous. <coughs> man, man, I gotta talk more often and exercise these voice muscles. Um, the sympathetic nervous system gets us all wound up and ready to survive. So what happens is our heart rate goes up, uh, our breathing gets almost like we're panting, um, our blood pressure goes up and blood is diverted away from our digestive organs more towards our extremities, to our hands and arms in case we have to throw a strike, to our feet and legs in case we have to run away. Doesn't sound real appealing to me, but nothing is all good and nothing is all bad. We have to have a sympathetic nervous system. Our species was able to survive all of these years because we had the good sense to run away from danger, most of us. But we don't wanna be in a sympathetic state all the time. Sometimes we want our heart rate to be normalized. We want our tension to go down. Dr. Honigman did a wonderful job of talking about this and explaining it uh, earlier this morning. His lecture is also archived on our Facebook page. Please listen to his spin on the same information of how important it is. We would rather be, except in times of fight or flight and survival, we wanna be in a parasympathetic state, not a sympathetic state. So the cerebellum, the same part of the brain that helps to govern or, or modulate coordinated activity is gonna inhibit our sympathetic nervous system. So when we're doing exercises like deep breathing, the, the cerebellum is the part of the brain that's most susceptible to oxygen deprivation. When you're gasping for air, the cerebellum is a part of the brain that's gonna fail the first. It's gonna fail the hardest and it's gonna fail the first. So once again, why do we do this deep breathing exercise? Here's one more reason. We wanna drive our cerebellums. We wanna be out of a sympathetic state into a relaxed parasympathetic state. Why do we do this coordinated foot drill? Well, we wanna drive our cerebellums and get them to be more active and more engaged. Why? So we can be more in a rest, digest, calm state of being less than a wound up fight or flight when there's no sign of danger. So far, so good, Candace. Okay, so the cerebellum. When we talk about the nervous system, nerves are, when we get out into the body and away from the brain, the brain and the spinal cord are the central nervous system. The nerves throughout the periphery are gonna be our peripheral nervous system. Our nervous system, our nerves out in the periphery are not continuous, they are contiguous. That means they're little, there's a nerve last so far, there's a little gap, and then the same nerve continues. So we have these little gaps between where does a nerve stop and restart? And many, many, many nerves and multiple nerves and, and a whole meshwork can come together and act as a unit and influence one another at those little gaps. And that's called a synapse. So how does the nervous system, how do all these nerves know where they're supposed to synapse and where they're not? Well, they synapse based on their diameter. 
If a nerve is a certain size and diameter, it will synapse with the same size diameter nerve or a similar size diameter nerve. Now, when we talk about pain fibers, we talked about this, this uh, substance P that is let out in response to tissue destruction, and it's gonna travel through the body on a certain fiber, uh, or it's gonna send messages that travel on a uh, certain fiber, nerve fiber size, and those are called C fibers. Everything has to have a name. We've designated these pain fibers as C. The sympathetic nervous system sends transmissions that are also on a very similar, if not identical size fiber as the C fibers. So the sympathetic nervous system and the C fibers are capable of synapsing with one another. Because this is artificial, they're not supposed to, but they can. It's not called a synapse. It's called an EFAPS. So if we have this EFAPTIC transmission that occurs between C fibers of pain and the sympathetic nervous system, you can almost see how one would influence the other and one might even become the other. True or false? If your body feels like it's in pain, you feel like you're wound up. Maybe you have a difficult time sleeping. Uh, maybe you uh, get agitated. Your, your mood starts to depress. These are all products of how are the sympathetic nervous system and how are the pain fibers communicating or even as the case may be, miscommunicating with one another. So once again, we want to break up those cycles. We want to do exercises that will stimulate the cerebellum and feed it the delicious oxygen. We want to move our joints through ranges of motion. We wanna loosen up tight muscles to allow those joints to move even further. And we're going to, uh, um, to get out of pain this way from a neurological standpoint without using uh, pharmaceutical chemistry. Candice, questions, comments, moral outrages? Nope, we just had someone else comment um, from the previous comment, just saying that they had been to the clinic before. They yeah, came to clinic. see, yeah, they came to okay. see Dr. Weiner um, when they lived in the area. Okay. Um, so just it's just another person emphasizing that this is an issue, the bone on bone, and it's something that can be looked at from a more mm. natural standpoint and dealt with much better. Well, I, I appreciate somebody giving a testimonial to the things that, that um, we're talking about and relating past hopefully successful experiences. And uh, Dr. Weiner has been gone. Uh, we're closing in on three years at this point. So to whoever left that comment, I hope that you're still, you've done well and you continue to do well. And if you don't have a chiropractor in your area, uh, let us know where you are and we'll help you find one uh, and continue good success. And thanks for chiming in. So neuromusculoskeletal chiropractic. People come to see me because they're in pain. People come because they want strategies to get out of pain that will involve some hands-on adjustment and manipulation and changes of, of how their brains and their bodies are communicating with one another. Um, they're, by and large, my patients are hoping to avoid surgery, especially joint replacement surgery. Uh, they want guidance as to what the right nutritional supplementation they should take to help reinforce their uh, healing. Which low-tech exercises should I be doing to help reinforce and accelerate my healing? Those are, those are my patients. Um, but we want to talk about other benefits to being a, a, a patient here in our clinic. Um, I'm very interested, I'm profoundly interested in doing things to help people breathe deeper. I, I really look for, I go out of my way to look for uh, problems in the parts of the aspects of the thoracic spine and in the rib cage where uh, um, this has to move through a greater range of motion to allow you to breathe deeper through your diaphragm. Uh, I'm looking to do adjustments and manipulations with people to help them improve their balance, their systemic ranges of motion, um, their, um, their coordination, their general athleticism. All of, these, all of these things are done through hands-on chiropractic, which includes a little bit of muscle release, muscle stretching, 
uh, um, assisted athletic stretching, the things that we do in our clinic with no equipment other than my minds, my hands, and uh, occasionally an elbow. Um, my patients have ranged between ages two weeks old to 96 years old. So I don't really look at anybody's age as being qualifying or disqualifying from being able to help them. I mean, I told you at the beginning, I don't have the answer for everybody. Beware of anybody who says that they do, but I've been able to have an answer or part of the answer or some or even most of the answer for many, many people over a very wide spectrum of age. And we might look at somebody who's been given a diagnosis that that seemingly sounds uh, uh, daunting, but it doesn't mean that we can't do something to help them to make their, their whole biopsychosocial experience just a little bit better. If the things that I'm talking about resonate with you, if you're thinking about, well, I've never seen a chiropractor, uh, um, I, I've been tempted to try chiropractic, if you feel like you just want to come in and have a consultation and talk about what you have going on, and maybe we can talk about some strategies that you can do for yourself. Uh, I mean, this is, this is an open invitation that um, I look at, um, you know, I have, a, I have a very, very tight social circle. I mean, I have a great relationship with my parents. I have some very close friends. Uh, um, I have the outer rings of my social circle. And I look at my patients as an entirely different part of my social circle that, you know, I think it's really unprofessional to have a, a social life out of the office with patients. So on one hand, I hardly know people at all. On the other hand, I have a very warm relationship with most of my patients in the treatment room. And I, I have uh, so many names, just so many people that I look at my schedule first thing in the morning and, and I crack a grin because this one is coming in and I crack a wide smile. You didn't even think I knew how to smile, did you? <laughs> and I smile wide at the recognition of that one's name and my eyes light up at the sight of the next one's name. And there, there are people on my roster that I, I just really, really look forward to seeing because we've done so much good work together and because they're involved in what it is that I'm, I'm putting out there and you can see how well they respond and they're, they're grateful to me and I'm grateful to them and we just do our best to have a good time no matter what the, the circumstances might be. And, and this, this presentation here in some way is an open invitation to the people who are listening who want to join that circle in my life. Uh, let's figure out if there are things that I can do to help you. Let's figure out if there are things I can teach you to do for yourself that maybe, maybe you don't need a chiropractor if you do, God forbid, <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't need a chiropractor if we can figure out two or three exercises that you should be doing every day. I, I don't know. Let's, let's put our brains on the problem and get to work at it. So unless there are any other questions, comments, or more outrageous, Candice, no, this was a really good overview of just chiropractic in general and tying in the neurology. And my favorite is the deep breathing because that's something that you can do anywhere on your own. And something personally, like I've, I've struggled with, if I ever, um, you know, sit down to read or get on the radio show or something like this after I've just like run up the steps or something, I really have to reset myself. So this is something that I learned in my twenties that I'd never really thought about before. So it's a conscious effort, but it's something that you could do on your own. You know, if people aren't in the area to come see you or aren't coming to see you weekly or every day, um, that's something that they could do on their own. And I love that you always get up and make people involved in um, when you're speaking and just have them really understand it and give them a good takeaway. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Candace. Um, so anyway, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all who tuned in and just because I can't see you doesn't mean I won't be checking the Facebook page later to see if anybody was involved or anybody wanted to have some private follow up or anything like that. So, so thank you. Thank you all so much for your kind attention. Um, Candace, thank you for your help uh, moderating this, of course. And this, this workshop conversation, whatever it's called I anymore, this was, this was really about what can your chiropractor do to help you. On Monday morning, I have another presentation, and that presentation is going to be a lot more about what can your chiropractor do to teach you how to help yourself. So um, 
this is part one that's going to be part two so i invite everybody i invite everybody to tune into everything all week long there's nothing but good stuff going on here um because it's all archived on facebook you don't have to sit tight for all these hours consecutively of watch 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 presentations in bits and chunks uh get what you can out of it and uh, I, I look forward to face-to-face -to -face contact with as many as possible. And thank you all uh, once again. Yeah, we're all looking forward to this as well. I see that you're on the morning commentary, Monday morning at 8.30 a.m. And then you kick it off at 9 a.m. talking right. about part two right, to year right. two. You know, you know last, in, the summer, in the summer of 2019, I had a student intern who shadowed me for quite a while. Yeah. And, and she had, I mean, she had a, a very a very um it was draconian i mean she had to do a lot of hours and she had to put in a lot of time and i, I was doing like some math in my head thinking like man 30 hours a week for 10 weeks i, I get sick of myself at a certain point jeez you poor girl <laughs> so anyhow i it looks like i'm just going to be on the zoom for two presentations in a row on monday morning and I promise everybody, I promise you all, like at some point, you're going to get sick of me. I get it. But it's not going to be Monday morning. I got a lot of good stuff and it's different stuff. I'll see you then. Thanks, Dr. O. Thank you, Candace.